Hello everyone, welcome back and in today's video, we're going to be solving some problems from electrodynamics which appeared in recent AITS. So the first question is a circuit problem. So we have a circuit shown and uh, which has switches S1 and S2 over here in which switches S1 and S2 remains closed for a long period of time. Now S3 and S4 are closed simultaneously. Just after S3 and S4 are closed, I1 and I2 are the currents just after S3 and S4 are closed. So we have to match these parameters with the answers. Okay guys, so firstly S1 and S2 2 were closed for a very long period of time. So these two loops of the circuit are what we have to study. The central loop is not being used right now. Okay. In the first loop, it's a simple RC circuit. And after a long period of time, we know that when the capacitor will be fully charged, the potential drop across the capacitor will equal the potential drop of the battery. And uh, also there won't be any current in the circuit. So essentially after a very long time, the potential drop across the capacitor is simply going to be 2E. Okay. And similarly on the right, we have a simple LR circuit. So in the LR circuit is after a very long period of time, the current flowing through the circuit attains a constant value uh, and the back EMF due to the inductor is just zero at that particular point because there is no change in flux and that constant current let's call it I we can easily find it as uh, for that we can just treat the inductor as a conducting wire because it doesn't have any back EMF when the current is constant so that current I is simply going to be E divided by 2R so in the steady state there will be counterclockwise circulating current in the right circuit so this is how the situation is at t equal to zero so now uh, what's happening is we close these two switches as well and now the middle circuit is also going to come into picture what they have essentially asked is the current uh, is the current i1 i2 the rate of change of energy in the capacitor and the rate of change of magnetic field inside the inductor okay so first let's figure out i1 and i2 so now we have closed s3 and s4 okay so now two things first is the voltage across the capacitor it won't change instantaneously it's physically impossible to change it instantaneously so we know at t equal to zero it had a potential of 2e right so at t equal to zero plus let's say we close these two branches so now the thing is just after closing the potential across the capacitor will still be 2e well you can explain this in two ways so one way is we know that the voltage across the capacitor is q by c so now if you want to change the voltage across the capacitor very quick then dv by dt has, has to tend to infinity which means we need an infinite current in this branch which is physically impossible or you can even think, think this in the way that the energy across the capacitor is going to be q square by 2c or half cv square right so it takes some time to inject or extract the energy from that branch we cannot instantaneously change the energy in the branch so and therefore just after we close the switch right at t equal to zero plus the potential across the capacitor will still be the same exactly by using similar arguments we can say that the current in the inductor branch won't change instantaneously so the magnetic energy stored in the inductor is half li squared right again we cannot instantaneously change the energy so so the current in the inductor branch will still be i which we figured out over here the current everywhere else will change but in the inductor branch it will still be i so now in the question they said that in this branch take the current to be i1 and in this branch we take the current to be i2 and we have to solve for it so now what i'm going to do is guys i'm going to apply kvl in this particular loop now the reason i'm not taking this loop is because in the if you take this loop then you have to write the back emf on the inductor so whose magnitude is l di by dt right so just so that we can avoid it i'm going to take this loop over here so if i write kvl in the clockwise sense the capacitor potential rises by an amount of 2e in this resistor over here a potential drop is i1 r the current in the inductor branch is i in the downward direction and a current of i1 is coming from the left so the which means the current in the 2r resistor is going to be i1 minus the potential drop is going to be minus 2r multiplied by i1 minus i i i am going to write it as e divided by 2r then we have a battery so potential drop of minus e and this would all add up to zero you can directly solve this equation to find i1 it comes out to be 2.5 amperes now guys for i2 if you simply observe i2 is just i is coming from this branch and i i1 minus i is coming from this branch so when they merge together the total current that will be flowing towards the left is i1 itself so i2 is just minus of i1 so which means i2 is going to be minus 2.5 amperes okay minus because the actual direction of current flow is towards the left in this branch Okay, so if you look at the options, both I1 and I2 match with P and I1 is positive and I2 is negative. So now we have to talk about the rate of change of the energy of the capacitor. So basically we have to talk about the power in this branch. So the power across the capacitor, I can simply write it as the potential difference across the capacitor multiplied by the current in this branch. So let's call it PC. So this would be equal to the voltage across the capacitor. You know, again, guys, we're talking about 
t equal to 0 plus when the switches are just closed so the potential across the capacitor is 2e multiplied by the current in the capacitor branch so now we have to determine the current so if you uh, apply kvl in this particular loop you can see that uh, plus 2e and minus 2e just cancels each other out there won't be any current across this resistor 3r so essentially this i2 that you know comes in this direction just flows through the capacitor meaning the current in the capacitor branch is going to be just 2.5 amperes so ic is just equal to 2.5 amperes so substituting the values and this just comes out to be 50 watts so now i have to determine the rate of change of energy in the inductor for that i need the potential drop across the inductor so for that what i'm doing is applying kvl in this loop so the potential rise across the capacitor is 2e potential drop across the resistor i1 multiplied by r okay so now as i took the current flow direction in the downward direction uh, we can assume the potential to drop in the direction of current so this is going to be minus ldi by dt and together this will all add, all add up to zero so now why did i take minus ldi by dt so assume that the current in this branch is increasing if the current in this branch is increasing in this direction then the back emf would be in this direction so as you can see if di by dt is positive the potential is dropping so basically all you have to do is assume a direction of current and in the direction of current write the potential drop across the inductor as minus ldi by dt ldi by dt which is the potential drop across the inductor comes out to be 40 by 3 so what they have asked in this question is the rate at which magnetic energy inside the inductor is changing and we have to assume the inductor to be a solenoid thousand turns per unit length and its volume is given i'm going to use a standard result here and that is the inductance of a solenoid we can write it as mu naught n square times v okay where mu naught is the permittivity of free space n is the number of turns per unit length and v is the volume of the solenoid and this you can derive pretty easily so from here we can figure out di by dt and the magnetic field inside a long solenoid is mu naught n i so l i am going to write it as mu naught n square v and di by dt i am going to write it as uh, 1 by mu naught n times dv by dt and this comes out to be 40 by 3 and from here even the magnetic field rate of change also comes out to be 2.5 2.5 tesla per second okay guys and also we had to discuss about the sign if you observe in the capacitor branch the current is flowing in the upward direction meaning positive charges are being flowing into the negative plate so that essentially means the capacitor is being discharged in this case so the power rate of change of energy in the capacitor is going to be negative so and that's why 3 is going to be matched with 50 and negative so qt 3 is going to match with qt and for the inductor case we figured out calculated ldi by dt it came out to be positive which means the current in the inductor branch is increasing it just means that the magnetic field is increasing with time and we can also see that db by dt just came out to be positive so and therefore the rate of change of magnetic field is going to be positive and p so 4 is going to match with p and s so the answer to this question is option a now moving on to the next question so this problem is from magnetism in this question we, we have been given a cross-sectional view of a long cylinder and current is flowing along the axial direction of the cylinder the current i flows along the outward direction along the length of the cylinder then we have to find the line integral of the magnetic field along the path ba so first we can talk about the signs right and as the current is out of the plane then the circuit if you curl your fingers the direction comes out to be in the counterclockwise sense so the magnetic field at point a let's say if i join it to the point o is going to be perpendicular to the the radius vector so if you calculate the line integral from b to a it is going to be negative right because your displacements are in the b a direction whereas the magnetic field as a component in the opposite direction as the angle between the magnetic field and the dl vector is greater than 90 degree integral of b dot dl is going to be negative so a and c cannot be the answer first of all when it comes to the line integral of magnetic field we know that if i take any arbitrary loop and perform line integral through that loop this result actually comes out to be mu naught times the enclosed current by that loop and this is what ampere's law is right now the issue is this is not a complete loop right this is just a line but if i purposefully complete a loop something like this then the thing is uh, now i can perform line integral throughout this loop and i can say that the total line integral of b dot dl is mu naught times enclosed current in this case there is also an additional advantage so if you connect point o to a and b everywhere if you curl your fingers we know that the magnetic field in this case in the theta cap direction there is no magnetic field in the radial direction so at each point along this radial line ao the magnetic field is going to be perpendicular in direction to the displacements so if you do b dot dl for the line ao and similarly for the line bo this just comes out to be zero as the magnetic field is perpendicular to the dl vectors at each particular point so the loop integral just becomes b dot dl from b to a okay and this is going to be mu naught times 
minus of mu naught times i enclosed and this is the enclosed current that we need to figure out for that we need this angle let's call it alpha okay guys so this angle is given to be 45 degrees this angle we have to figure out let's call it alpha this distance is 2r and so this angle is going to be 135 minus alpha so i am applying sine rule in this triangle over here so from here we get sine of 135 minus alpha equals root 3 plus 1 divided by 2 root 2 now this particular value over here we can if i rearrange it a bit so this comes out to be root 3 by 2 multiplied by 1 by root 2 plus half multiplied by 1 by root 2 if i i can write it as sine of 30 plus 45 so 135 minus alpha i can say it is equal to 75 or I can also say it is 180 minus 75, right? Because so there are two possible values of alpha. Why? Because sine of theta is the same as sine of 180 minus theta. Okay, so 30 degrees, uh, if I divide it by 360 degrees, it corresponds to 1 by 12. So the I enclosed will be I by 12 in this case, and the I enclosed in this case will be I by 6. So the answer is going to be mu naught I by 6 and mu naught I by 12 with a negative sign. So the answer to this question will be option B and option D. Okay, so in this question, we have a parallel square plate capacitor of side length A and it is connected to a cell of EMF 3 volt. Dielectric whose mass is M and dielectric constant is K initially completely fills a space between the parallel plate capacitor. The dielectric is connected to a solid cylinder whose mass is M as well through a string. The, the cylinder is now pulled by a tangential force of 1 Newton and acting on the top of the cylinder. The surface between the cylinder and the horizontal surface is rough enough to prevent slipping. The distance between the plate is D and they are claiming that the and they are stating the graph between the current through the cell. The plot of I versus T is a straight line till the dielectric leaves the capacitor. So we have to find the slope of this straight line. Okay. So that's the problem. Okay, so the problem related to the electrodynamics part is essentially we have to figure out the current in the circuit as well as the force acting on this dielectric plate while it is being while it is being pulled out. So first let's figure out the current in the circuit as that is the easiest. So let's say the EMF of the battery is E. Okay, so and I am taking the equivalent capacitance here. So let's call it C equivalent. Okay, and uh, now if you apply KVL in this loop, so we can easily see the charge Q on the capacitor plate C multiplied by E. So alternatively, we can also say that Q by C is E, which is a constant. So the potential drop across the capacitor will always be equal to the EMF of the battery. So if I want to figure out the current, I'll just differentiate this expression. So the current in the circuit I becomes equal to E multiplied by DC by DT, right? So now we have to figure out how is the capacitance changing with respect to the time. So first we have to figure out the equivalent capacitance. Let's say the left end of the dielectric is at a distance of X from this end of the capacitor. So, so uh, now the cross section of the capacitor is a square of side length A. So the length of the dielectric part is going to be A minus X. Okay. So now I can treat it as two capacitors in parallel where this is the air capacitor and this is the capacitor plate dielectric in between. So the equivalent capacitance I can write as uh, epsilon naught times the area of cross section times a now a the area in this case is going to be x multiplied by a divided by the separation between the plates which is d plus for the dielectric part it is going to be k1 epsilon naught times the area which is a minus x into a in this case divided by the plate separation so this is the equivalent capacitance so if we separate out the x terms uh, this is the expression that we get for the equivalent capacitance uh, as a function of x so now as it as it is being pulled out we can see uh, the value of x is going to increase so the capacitance is going to decrease now the value of epsilon naught a by d into k minus 1 is given to be 1 by 9 right equals k c naught where c naught is the capacitance of the air capacitor x divided by 9 okay so this is the final expression for the capacitor capacitance that we are getting okay so now the current in the circuit is nothing but the emf e times dc by dt and dc by dt if you observe it is it comes out to be minus 1 by 9 times dx by dt which let's just call it as x so it's a rate at which the distance x is increasing so that will be just the velocity of this dielectric plate which so this just comes out to be minus ev divided by 9 now e is 3 volt so this is minus v by 3 so now the goal is to figure out the velocity of the of the dielectric plate okay so for that we have to analyze the force that is acting on this dielectric plate okay guys so when we have a capacitor uh, whose positive plate is this one and whose negative plate is this one the electric field lines we usually assume as uniform uh, in the region between the plates right but as we have to deal with the regions present at the end of the capacitor we cannot say that the electric field will be uniform but the end of the electrodes 
we cannot say that the electric fields are going to be uniform. In fact, uh, the electric field lines will become non-uniform and it will be it will look something like this. This is called fringing of field lines or edge effects. So now uh, I want you to imagine a dielectric plate present over here. So we know that as an electric field passes through the dielectric plate, the charges are induced at inside the dielectric plate, uh, something like this. And this is to ensure that the internal field cancels out the external electric field. And the external electric field is in this direction. So the internal electric field needs to be in the upward direction. And for that, plus and minus charges will arrange themselves something like this. So now we have dielectric whose, in which negative charges are present over here and positive charges are present at this surface. Observe, let's just take the point over here. So here we have negative surface charge density and here we have positive surface charge density, right? Take a look at this field line over here. So negative charges will feel a force in this direction opposite to the field line and the positive charges will feel a force in the direction of the field line. So if you observe something, the net force is trying to pull the dielectric inside of the capacitor. If I put if I put the dielectric over here, what will happen is the electric field will try to pull the dielectric inside. And if the dielectric is placed present over here, here the fringe line will be in this direction and you can, even in this side, the electric force will try to pull the dielectric into the capacitor. And the magnitude of this force, it comes out to be, so half E square times DC by dx. So this uh, looks similar to the differentiating the energy stored in the capacitor. So if you write down the energy stored in the capacitor, it is half CV squared, right? And we know that V across the capacitor plates is constant. So if you do du by dx, it becomes half dc by dx times V squared. But this is not the way we derive this expression. So I'm not gonna get into the derivation in this video. If you guys want a derivation video, I'll tell in the comments. I'll make another video. E square is going to be nine. So if you differentiate C with respect to x, you'll get one by nine, right? I'm gonna substitute it over here. The pulling force as 0.5 Newton. So, okay, so now the thing is, we know that the force that acts on this dielectric plate is 0.5. Okay, so uh, basically this solid cylinder over here is rolling without slipping. So let's say it has an acceleration of A in this direction and a clockwise angular acceleration of alpha. So we can balance the net torque about the instantaneous axis of rotation. So the tension force, uh, I can write it by applying F equals to MA on the dielectric plate. T minus 0.5 equal to the mass of the dielectric plate, which is 0.1 times the acceleration A. So from here, we get T as 0.1 A plus 0.5. So, so now I can balance a torque on the cylinder over here for the IAOR. So the, one, the torque due to one Newton is going to be one multiplied by two R. Torque due to the tension force is going to be minus into R. And this would be equal to the moment of inertia about this horizontal axis passing through IAOR. So above the center, it is MR square by two. We need to add another MR square. So this becomes three by two MR squared times alpha, which is in rolling condition A by R. So from here, A turns out to be six meters per second square. So the velocity of the dielectric plate is going to be six T, right? So now we go back to our current expression and we substitute the value of V as six T divided by three, which comes out to be minus two T. So essentially what this means is that the direction of current we took is wrong and it is actually in the opposite direction. We took the direction of current to be such that the capacitor is being charged, but in fact the capacitor is losing charge, means, which means the current is flowing into the cell. But if you observe in the question, what they asked was the graph between the current through the cell versus time t. So, uh, which means we have to take the negative of this. So, so, which means the current is going to be, so the current through the cell is going to be 2t. And what they essentially asked was the slope of it curve, which is di by dt which is two. So the answer for this problem is two. So yeah, that was it for this video guys. If you enjoyed the video, please do like, share and subscribe. And that's it. Thanks for watching.